everybody. I hope the breakout sessions were fruitful for all of you. We will now start the second plenary session of the symposium, Perspective on the Volunteering Landscape. We would also like to remind you that you may use your symposium app to participate in this session. Just click on the pause button to join the symposium Q&A session. We would also like to remind you that you may use your symposium app using the key to our event passcode, which is SGSLS2018. Once again, SGSLS2018. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to submit them through Pigeonhole. Now, may I also take this opportunity to make a special mention to Wendy, our visual recorder. She's seated right at the back. And yeah, for the beautiful artwork, and also it serves as a summary for the key takeaways of today's symposium. May I also may I encourage you to have another round of, of applause for Wendy? Thank you. As the volunteering landscape continues to evolve, there is a need to change the ways we engage with our volunteers. This session explores the motivation of volunteers and suggests strategic and innovative ways to engage different types of volunteers and stakeholders to play a part in supporting community development. The diverse backgrounds of the panel speakers will offer valuable insights and viewpoints on building strategic, on building strategic partnership in the ecosystem and tailoring engagement to cultivate a more caring and inclusive society. Uh, we would like to introduce the moderator for today's session, Mr. Tai ing -cho, founder of two thriving social enterprises, Geelang Adventures and Dakota Adventures, and winner of the Singapore Youth Award 2017. And may I also just share that I was privileged to join Mr. Tai in his Little India Adventure last year. Not sure if he re still remembers. And the knowledge that I brought back was r r really raw and really, uh, it opened up my perspective uh, of the different communities in Singapore. And hopefully in time to come, I can join him in the Geelang Adventures. And hopefully I can find out what exactly my friends are saying this thing about uh, Sun Lake Sun. <laughs> All right, Mr. Tai, a uh, hand for Mr. Tai, please. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, hi everyone. Welcome to the Singapore Service Learning Symposium Plenary 2 session. So, I hope you guys had a fruitful day uh, so far. So, without further ado, we're going to dive right into the session itself. And we have four very esteemed panelists uh, right here. So, we'll first get them to share um, each of them their perspectives uh, on the volunteering landscape in Singapore. So, I'd like to take the conversation to Si Liang first. Um, so, each of you maybe just share a story about who you are, where you come from, and also your role in the volunteering space. Si Liang, please. Um, so, I'm Si Liang. I'm from the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre. So, NVPC, what we do is we try and promote giving. So, we try and make uh, part of that is volunteering and we try and make it our business to know what's, what's going on and to try and help promote that. Um, my role in the giving space, uh, in the volunteering space, I volunteer sometimes. Anything else you'd like to share? Um, so, so MVPC, well, okay. Well, I'll talk a bit about what MVPC does then. So MVPC does a little, uh, in terms of promoting volunteerism, we have platforms like Giving.sg, which is a portal that um, you can look for volunteering opportunities. And then we have other programs like the Volunteer Experiential Program. So that's something that helps uh, like regular people know what it's like to volunteer in a few um, different nonprofits. Then there are other programs like Giving Week, which is a campaign and a movement that we're trying to drive so that people will, you know, start giving during a, a period at, uh, towards the end of the year. All right, thank you very much. So I gather that you guys are a giving platform, right? Um, so anything, opportunities for giving, look for Si Liang. All right, next up, we have uh, Alinda from Youth Call Singapore. Uh, you see their banners pretty much everywhere, and a few of them wearing the shirts. Yeah, you guys are the organizers, right? Yeah, hope you are not the only one in the room. Uh, so thank you very much for being here on stage with us today, Alinda. So, um, uh, take it away. 
Yeah, so I'm um, Alinda. Um, I started volunteering when I was 17 um, through uh, OCIP with my JC. Um, so thereafter, I started my own volunteering journey, um, going to community service clubs in university to volunteer. And when I became a secondary school teacher, um, I also created volunteering opportunities for my students. Um, and now I'm at Youth Call. Uh, the core of my job is to create um, Volunteering opportunities um, with fellow government agencies and social service organizations so as to provide a positive volunteering experience um, to our youths um, in Singapore. Uh, my own personal interest uh, and passion is in seniors. So a lot of the projects that I work on are seniors and youth related. Uh, and it is geared towards uh, creating the intergenerational um, understanding and bonds between the two um, different groups of participants. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Alinda. Um, so I believe we've heard um, from Youth Call as well as MVPC, who are a bit more formal organizations. Um, today with us, we also have a couple who are more on a private initiatives. So first, we have Rebecca from the Social Co. Um, once again, I'd also like to remind you guys that we have the Pigeon Ho. Uh, so please feel free to throw in any questions that you might have uh, as you hear the um, panelists speak. All right, so Rebecca, please. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. Um, I am a young punk, <laughs> for the lack of a better word. Um, and I think what I do is that I try to bring together other young punks to come together and do something fun and creative at the same time. And my main role in, um, in terms of volunteering is actually in fundraising. So together with other young punks, we do young punk things uh, to, to try to raise uh, money and awareness for lesser known charities in Singapore. So um, the, the projects we've done include 50 for 50 and Pledge It Forward. Um, and that was more really trying to rally young people to come together, do fun activities to, yeah, to, to raise funds and raise awareness. So yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, wow, young punk thing. So I hope you guys identify with being a young punk. Um, I'm not sure whether there's an age limit for that, like 35 or something like that. But I believe you didn't use the word youth intentionally. So lastly, we have uh, James, uh, who is the founder and lead strategy consultant for Emmaus. Am I pronouncing that right? Okay, so Emmaus, uh, what do you do, James? Tell us. Um, okay, I'm definitely not a young punk. <laughs> yeah, um, well, for me, I actually started off as a social worker and uh, kind of like in my journey, uh, I'm quite an accidental volunteer manager, so I didn't quite thought that I would go into volunteer management. So uh, I've actually worked with a few um, charities in volunteer management and grew to really love it. So uh, last year, what happened is that after many years of working in uh, doing volunteer management for different charities, uh, I also burnt out. So uh, I came out and set up my own um, social enterprise, which is actually very new, uh, so EMEA Strategies. So effectively, uh, it marries the two things that I'm very passionate about. One is in the area of volunteer management. So uh, basically, what we do is we look into helping charities to be a little bit more fruitful uh, in terms of building and, and, and you know, building their volunteer management capacity through consultancy and through um, training as well. And then in the area of uh, burnout, we actually basically help people to prevent and overcome burnout. Yeah, so that's pretty much what, what I do. All right, so that's a very interesting perspective uh, with regards to burnout. All right, so um, once again, a reminder, we have the pigeonhole online. Um, so, before we begin to look at the pigeonhole, maybe I'll start with a couple of questions, right? So, in your own perspectives, like, what are the challenges that you see for youth specifically um, in whether it's joining a volunteer initiative? What are some trends they experience uh, in your own space, uh, whether it's in your organization or your own volunteering experience? What are some challenges that you think uh, might prevent youth from volunteering nowadays? Um, so I think one of the key ones that actually keeps us awake at night is uh, actually one of the problems where youths, they stop school, they actually have this drop-off in volunteering. Uh, so we, we know that actually traditionally youths in school, they actually volunteer quite a lot. In fact, one of the most in the population. But then once they start school at around the age of, sorry, start work at around the age of 25, um, when priorities change and then, you know, your schedules change and all, um, then the volunteering rate really, really drops off a cliff. Yeah, so that's, that's one. 
for youths who are younger, um, I think one of it is uh, them, they are still studying. They have a lot of different commitments, be it CCA, they have um, like school homework to do, and we are still academically driven. Um, so their focus will be more on um, their studies, um, having fun with their own friends versus um, going out to do volunteering beyond their school hours or beyond their VIA. Um, so I think that's one of the challenge is um, the lack of time because of all the different interests that they have. Um, the other challenge that I think is if they have, you know, they, they have the courage to sign up for one volunteering event at a one-off level, um, when they go to the organization, um, some of the challenges that may, they may face is um, they already have the desire to do good. They already have the courage to sign up for one time. Um, not regular yet, but one time. But when they go there, the challenge is, okay, how am I going to speak to a senior? How am I going to interact with uh, someone with special needs? How can I really uh, make a difference, uh, even though I have already set aside time for it? So what they need is really um, support in terms of their volunteering journey um, once they actually sign up for an event. Yeah. Okay, I also believe that the, present uh, the presenters also have a presentation that they'd like to share with uh, all of us. So um, maybe we will jump right into that. So we'll start with the first uh, set of slides. Can we get the one for NVPC? Okay, so while we're working on that, um, I believe you guys uh, are from different organizations and different roles. Uh, but what we're also trying to learn from is what kind of methodology that each of the organization takes. So, Siliang, please. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll share a little bit about the giving landscape and the volunteering landscape. Uh, not, uh, it'll start off as not a youth-specific thing uh, in particular, and then I think the rest of them will, will share a little bit more about um, youth-specific volunteerism. So I think before we talk about what's happening right now, let's talk a little bit about what's, what we're seeing, uh, the trends that are coming in the future. So first of all, I think one of the big trends that we, we see is give us behaving more as consumers. Um, so you see people who donate, but they're not just happy to give you $10 because you're a charity, but then they're now asking questions about, oh, who are you actually serving? What, where is this money going to go to? Um, and similarly, in a volunteering kind of a space, we see that for volunteers, they're actually looking for meaningful activities. So not just, oh, okay, I'll come here and sweep the floor and, and be done with that, but then they will actually question and they will, they will say, can you give me something a bit more meaningful? Uh, and sometimes also, can you give me something easier? The second big trend that we see is actually a rise of individual activism. So you see actually a lot of peer-to-peer um, -peer fundraising campaigns. You see a lot of ground-ups that are starting, so in, in the free gun space or in homeless space, lots and lots of uh, individual um, causes. And you see people go straight to the problem and to try and do something about it than to, to, to actually work with traditional charities. And the last trend that we kind of want to talk about is collaboration. So we actually see a lot more collaboration, whether it's between ground-ups and government or businesses and, and traditional charities. And I think it's that realization that to achieve impact, uh, we need to work together. So what is volunteerism in Singapore actually like? Well, I think the first thing to note is actually between donating and volunteerism, you... Oh, wait. Actually, that's the next slide. Give me a buddy. <laughs> um, you see that actually volunteerism in Singapore is on a steady increase. So in the past 10 years, the, in 2008, volunteerism was actually 17%. And in 2016, when we took the measurement again, it's actually 35%. So kind of in the last 10 years, we've, we've almost doubled the proportion, the rate of people who are volunteering. And then correspondingly, you also see that the total number of hours has increased from 45 million hours to 121 million hours. So I think this is a reflection that um, overall, the, there's a greater awareness of needs in Singapore and a, a greater awareness of volunteering in Singapore. So, how volunteering compares to donation is that actually you notice that donations are always easier than volunteering. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because when you see someone on the street asking you for money, it's easy to give them a couple of coins or a couple of notes. But then if you want to volunteer, you have to put in effort to um, shift your schedule around and actually make time to go down and do it. Uh, if we look at volunteerism each, in age buckets-wise, like I mentioned just now, uh, for the 15 to 24 youth group, 
that's the school-going youth, you actually see a very high rate of volunteerism. And we actually exclude things like VIA and CIP, but we think that as a, probably as a result of these programs, you, know, you already know where to go, you're already familiar with what you're doing, you have the, the, you know, the empathy and the awareness of it. It's easier to continue volunteering. And then, like I said, once um, you start working, there's a huge drop-off. So that's something we've seen in, in many, many years. Uh, for the 25 to 34, priorities are different. People volunteer a lot less. In 2016, we also saw a huge uh, spike in the 35 to 44 and the 45 to 54. So this is, these are effectively your mid-career kind of working people. Uh, we think that might be because the CS, uh, CSR has made it a lot easier for people to volunteer. And so as a result, the volunteering rate there has actually increased um, beyond what was the, the school-going youth one. And uh, for the 55 and above seniors, we usually see a drop-off uh, in the volunteerism rate. So if we zoom in on the youth in, uh, in particular, well, I think the first thing to think about is what youth are really like. So we know youth make up about a quarter of the population. Uh, you know that they are, from, from the National Youth Survey, they are very civic-minded and they're very active in the community. Uh, but we also know that they're worried about a lot of things. So worry about things like studies, worry about uh, adult responsibilities, so things like you have to start paying your bills, uh, buying a flat, that kind of thing, it costs a lot. Um, they, in terms of what they desire, so there are a lot of youths who say that they would like to be taken seriously and they want to be useful. Uh, however, at the same time, they don't want to be regulated, they are entrepreneurial, they will pursue challenges. So, for us, we are actually thinking about youth and giving as a, could you feel the youthful rebellion by using giving? So I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, for youth, I think the main thing that we want to note is they, they actually have been the most enthusiastic volunteers but they volunteer in a way that's slightly different from the rest of the population. So youths tend to volunteer fewer hours on average, and they also tend to be more uh, ad hoc volunteers compared to regular volunteers. So this is quite consistent with, I think James might tell you that actually uh, sometimes youth tend to be, uh, they have short attention span, or uh, they tend to appear more, volunteer more at events rather than at a regular kind of activity. Well, whether this is, I mean, we think there are ways to engage them, and we'll talk about that in a bit, uh, but I think this is quite consistent with, with some of the observations that we see on the ground. So we also did a couple of interviews, uh, and we thought it'd be interesting to share about what youth look for in terms of volunteering. So this uh, youth volunteer at the top there, she's Nuru. One of the things that's actually very important to her is actually she says uh, impact of the volunteering and she's thinking about how that giving can spread. Similarly, we have another youth volunteer who said giving is a legacy. So even though they are youths, they are already thinking about um, the legacy. So I'll show you a quick uh, video about nu uh, of Nuru's interview and, and listen to what she says. You're a youth volunteer. The main things I always have trouble with is the adults because the adults like, where the adults can you listen to us? I know you want to volunteer, but we kind of own this place, so you listen to us. And I'm like, we came because we want to do something good, and they stop us from a lot of things, and our enthusiasm just dies down slowly. Yeah, we don't know anything about volunteer work, but we know that we want to help, you know, but they overlook that. I went back from being oppressed by adults to going overseas to build a school in three years. Mm -hmm. So at the last night of Vietnam, I sat down, and I'm like, wow, I've done a lot. Like, I'm like, wow, I've done a lot, you know, like, I remember the times that the grown up said no, and I'm like, I did this far, and the people that said I couldn't do it. One year later, I went to Vietnam, you know, it made me feel like, yes, yes, my motivation just went out, it's very really crazy. Yeah. So, if you heard what she said, uh, she, she actually said, um, youths actually want to do good, but then they, they, she used the word oppressed, she feels oppressed by adults. Um, when they want to do something, they, they, the adults say, no, this is our space, this is how things are done. Um, but for her, she managed to actually go to Vietnam, help build a school, and, and that really raised her motivation. So I think the challenge for us in thinking about youth volunteerism is how do you keep that fire burning without dampening it and, and keeping that uh, desire to want to do good going? 
Uh, and that's what we meant by giving as a youthful rebellion. So just a couple of ideas that we're going to throw up, and, and I know the rest of the panelists are going to talk a little bit more about that. But one of the ways is actually you can, you can offer them resources, uh, give them their own initiatives, provide them with the support uh, and the autonomy to do their own projects. So that's what we mean by fuel the rebellion. I think um, Ming Zhi from Campus Side this morning, he also talked about, sorry if I got your name wrong, uh, asking, asking youth what they want to do. And, and that's what is along the same line in, in uh, seeking their opinion. So that's a way for them to express themselves, uh, to be taken seriously and to be useful. And also a way that uh, you know, volunteer managers can validate them. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the rest because I know you guys are going to talk more about it. Uh, yeah, but that's the last point that I really want to leave you with. And if there's one thing that, that you can take away is Actually, different groups of people look for different things. You know, we say youth look for autonomy and they, they care a lot about the impact and the cost. Um, Midlife people, they care about inculcating values to the next generation. And then you have seniors. For them, relationships is damn important. You know, the relationship that they have with the volunteer manager, with the organization, that takes precedence over everything else. But I think the big thing that we want to share here is actually different groups of people, different groups of volunteers, they are all different in their own way. So the, I think the trick is finding out how to engage them uh, in a way that works for them to speak their language that, that is really um, important. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Su Liang. Um, yeah, so I think one of the takeaways that I had was about how youths align more with meaning. What is the purpose and what brings meaning to life? Um, kind of reminds me of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, as we become a lot more developed. Self-actualization is a huge thing. Um, so passing on the time now to an expert in youth matters under Youth Core, right? So tell us, Alinda, what do you have? Okay, um, yeah, this is a, I, I believe all of us actually uh, have the experience of managing youth volunteers, um, be it CIP or um, be it VIA students or uh, any random youth who walk through the doors. Um, this is just a simple sharing about what we have been trying out at Youth Core and it seems like uh, there have been positive responses from the youths and this is uh, some of our uh, program framework that we use. Um, so, um, we are... Uh, we would like to actually um, empower youths to equip our youths with our skills and knowledge so that ultimately um, it will inspire them and motivate them to become regular volunteers and later on step up to become volunteer leaders. I think in our landscape, uh, there are a lot of people who are saying that I need regular volunteers, I need volunteer leaders. But um, if you look left and right, basically everybody needs regular volunteers and volunteer leaders, but where are they? <laughs> So I think that's what Youth Corps is trying to do, is really plant the seeds of volunteering um, to let them have that positive uh, experience so that ultimately in their volunteering journey, they will really want to step up and do more. And that's where later on, I mean, many years later, we will see the fruits of our labour, um, especially if we work together in this um, journey. So first of all, in order to um, see how we can manage um, volunteers, we actually did a research on what are some of the motivations of um, volunteers when they come through the doors. Um, based on research, these are top five reasons why um, someone chooses to volunteer. Um, as you can see, there are intrinsic motivations like um, giving back to the community, um, learning new things um, for, to make a difference. And there are also some people with ulterior uh, motive, like um, making new friends, come here and find girlfriends or boyfriends. <laughs> and of course, the large bulk of our volunteers are from um, the schools, VIA, um, corporates, CSR, and sometimes we also have our MSF probationers um, coming in to join um, us in the volunteering journey. Um, regardless of where they come from, what was their initial motivation, I think um, what we need to do is um, to be mindful that everyone come in with different agenda. They come in um, with different motivations um, and it is impossible for us as volunteer managers to know the motivation of each and every volunteer who walk through the doors unless you conduct interview for every volunteer that um, sign up at your organization. Um, so what we do at Youth Call is that um, we, we don't really judge them for how they come in, um, but it helps us to have a better understanding of how to manage them. 
Uh, and we believe that for those people who actually come in, like, you know, come, uh, with VIA and all those, um, that's where we can actually do a lot more. And how can we um, create the experience such that, um, like what Minister Tan was sharing, um, someone who walked through the door as a CSR, how can we provide that once-off experience such that it will trigger off something in them and make them have the intrinsic motivation to come back? Yeah, so that is what we have been trying out. Um, so this is um, what we have been doing. Um, we, we make a deliberate effort to meet the needs of the volunteers. Um, in order for them to um, know that they are making a difference, is to develop in them a sense of purpose. Um, share with them on the onset, when you join us for a volunteering opportunity, what actually means to the community. Yeah, so it's really to let them know the why. Because youths nowadays, um, they don't really want to know what you want them to do. Yeah, they want to know why. It's, it's a lot of why, why, why. They will not ask you why, but they will just uh, have the, okay, you ask me to, um, let's say, bring the seniors from a nursing home to a hawker centre. They will sign up, then, it, then they, on the top of my mind, they'll be like, okay, why am I doing this? but they will not ask you the question. So in our programming, um, at the briefing stage, we already tell them why. So for example, we share with them, nursing home seniors, they are in the homes 24 seven. They usually do not have the opportunity to choose what they want to eat. So once or twice a year, we can have volunteers going into the nursing homes, bring them to the nearby hawker center. And for once or twice a year, these seniors who can make it for the trip, they get to choose what they want to eat. So it's really to comes out the why um, and, and not just on how they should do it and what they should do. Um, the other one that um, we actually work on is actually the sense of confidence. Um, we realize that for you volunteers, um, some of them, they already have the intrinsic motivation to do good, um, like what I mentioned just now, but they really don't even know how to break the ice with the seniors with the children and with the people with special needs or intellectual disability. So that's where we do not take um, befriending uh, skills as a default. We, we get our partners in um, to share with them befriending tips and to share with them some possible scenarios that they will face um, even before the actual interaction with the beneficiaries or the clients of the SSO. Um, the other one that we look into, like what was mentioned previously in the morning session, is the sense of belonging. It's the friendship that get, gets them coming back over and over again. It's the friendship with the seniors, the children, the special needs, and also with fellow volunteers. Um, so we are very deliberate in the sense that um, in the programming, we actually get them to network with each other um, to, to basically create a volunteering family. Um, we can have a class full of students going to a home together, but are they fellow volunteers supporting each other in a volunteering journey? Like, let's say if they feel some challenges, um, they, have some, they face some challenges in their interaction with the seniors, um, would they even feel that it's a safe space to share their challenges? Would they even want to, you know, um, seek help from others? So at Youth Call, we, we always have debrief. We get them to um, befriend each other first. Then we let them um, know that we are actually a volunteer family here to support one another. If you're experienced, share your experience with other people. If you're less experienced, never mind. We try again, we learn again, just come back, and then we are here for you. Um, the last one is really the sense of ownership. Once they are actually um, here and ready to do good, um, so that's where, like what uh, Siliang was saying, um, they, they have a lot of ideas. And that's where they start to take ownership. They will want to do more. But it's this sense of ownership that needs time to be built. Um, once it is built, um, that's where we, should, we could um, provide opportunities for them to um, explore new ideas and their own um, projects. Um, but at the onset, um, there should already be, you know, some uh, guidance given to them. Um, youths will have a lot of ideas confirmed, but whether the ideas really meet the community needs, that's where we actually need um, the staff from the social service organisation to get them to be more practical <laughs> and to to have their innovative ideas to, you know, like uh, be be more meaningful for the seniors and all those. Um, so with this, this is what we are driving through: positive volunteering experience from 
even a one-off volunteering session. Um, and right now, I'm going to sh share with you one example, Yodan Arts. Yodan Arts program is actually a collaboration between Youth Course Singapore, Agency for Integrated Care, National Arts Council. Um, created this 12-week um, um, session for our youth volunteers. The youth volunteers go through a two um, Saturdays training session by our staff at the social service organizations, by uh, Agency for Integrated Care and National Arts Council, basically to equip our volunteers to prepare them before they actually meet the seniors, and they will interact with the seniors for a period of 10 sessions. Thereafter, we will actually have a break in between the program, uh, and we will get our youth volunteers to sign up for the next round. Yeah, so um, here's the program. As an individual in a country with ageing population, I think the elder care sector is growing and definitely needs more attention. Yodan actually stands for Youth Plus Golden, uh, where youth refer to us, the volunteers, and Golden refers to the seniors. What Yodan Arts hopes to achieve is to promote intergenerational bonding through art activities. Youth Corps Singapore collaborated with the Agency for Integrated Care and National Arts Council for the Yodan Arts Programme. Through this collaboration, uh, we actually managed to tap on the resources and the strength of the different organisations to bring greater impact to the elder care community. Art allows for seniors to experiment and find their own creative process. The different activities also allow for different tactile experiences for them to build their own confidence, improve fine motor skills. More importantly, art creates an environment for conversations to go beyond the artwork, for seniors and youth volunteers to interact, understand each other better, thereby enriching their lives and inspiring intergenerational bonding. The 2D art program, we got to have hands-on experience of how to do art. The instructor even taught us like how we can complement colours and we actually have more skills before we can interact with the seniors in a more impactful manner. Nursing homes in Singapore are looking at improving their quality of care and so it looks beyond clinical care as well into psychosocial aspects. So the Yolden Arts program trains youth volunteers in arts as well as basic elder care and what has happened with us bringing in the toolkit is that uh, we now have a structured way of interactions um, and in a way it helps us to also surpass some language difficulties we might have, at least in terms of the youth volunteers and the seniors, and provides uh, an engaging and meaningful way for them to be able to interact with each other. I'm a visual arts student and I feel that I want to use my expertise in this area to contribute back to the society. It's very gratifying to see Madame Lo to have developed her own artistic sense and her own form of expression. Sometimes she's even like a mentor to me because Okay. Uh, so there's uh, some error, right? Never mind, it's available on YouTube. So, <laughs> so you can actually Google Yodan Arts, Youth Course Singapore. And the last part of the video, it actually um, has uh, um, our youth volunteers, our seniors, um, sharing with uh, the viewers um, the impact that they actually experience through the program, be it the learning from the youths and also um, the, the, the experience that the seniors went through. Yeah, uh, so it's a pity that I cannot see that part. Okay, but anyway, um, so I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay, um, for Yodan Arts, right, um, or rather any other volunteering opportunities that we have, um, what we actually uh, strive to do is really to augment the work of the staff uh, with trained youth volunteers uh, because we think that youth volunteers really need to be equipped with the skills and knowledge before they go. Um, I think there are a lot of um, educators out there thinking of which are the organisations that uh, provide training for youth volunteers. Um, I, I would say the quick answer is the organisation that you are partnering with. It requires a lot of buy-in from the organisation, but I think gradually they will see the effect. Um, so when we first started um, this kind of programs with our um, partners in nursing homes, they are also very worried that um, why should we pump in so much time in our youth volunteers when they may not stay for long. But um, if you manage to let them, to convince them to actually try out for one time and they see the effect, um, that's where they will be more willing to make the commitment. 
Um, so it's really getting the nursing home staff to actually train our youth volunteers and then to get them to augment the work that they are doing. So what happens is that um, there are already homes that are conducting um, activities for the seniors and these activities, uh, honestly, they need volunteers. One nursing home staff, like a nurse, versus 10 to 15 seniors. And every single senior is of a different mobility level. They actually need volunteers to provide that one-to-one -one, um, interaction and assistance. Um, the other one is um, the activity is actually very important. So we have tried different activities. Um, I think um, initially when I was a teacher, I tried getting our students to go and uh, go through the bingo sessions with the seniors. Um, it isn't... Okay, I know it's meaningful for the seniors, but it's not interesting for the volunteers. Um, to them, it's just sitting there waiting for the numbers. Um, so they do not feel engaged, they do not find it interesting. So they don't even look forward to the sessions at all. So it became like very forced. My, my teacher asked me to go and play bingo with the seniors. Yeah, um, but art is different. The other one is actually games. We have uh, Yodan uh, Physio, we call it Yodan Physio. We actually get our youth volunteers to go in and conduct um, physiotherapy games with our seniors, um, with the physiotherapists there to lead the sessions. Yeah. Um, so the activity needs to be interesting for all the participants. And um, in order to develop that ownership, I think, um, and for the youths to actually start their own uh, initiatives, it will be better if it is after they know the seniors. Um, because we found out that um, after they have the interaction with the seniors or with the beneficiaries, they will know their mobility level, they will know their interest, their, um, what possibly they can do, and that's where when they start an initiative, it will be better. Um, one quick example is that um, when, let's say, the volunteers need to come up with an outing um, idea, they will actually go and find places whereby it is wheelchair-friendly and the food provided is suitable for um, the seniors uh, to eat. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of program framework, I think this is our secret recipe. I sort of did a simple sharing um, just now. Uh, so we share, we share the aging population landscape. We get our social service partner to share about the issues that the seniors are facing, how they are playing a part. Um, during our debrief, which we always conduct, we get our youths to share what challenges that they face. Yeah, so we have volunteer breakdown. When the volunteers break down because of certain uh, interaction, um, we actually get our seniors to share, uh, our, our partners to actually share why is the senior behaving in this manner. Yeah. Um, and then um, in terms of sense of confidence, uh, like what I mentioned, um, getting um, the befriending tips out and then sharing with them. We can have experienced volunteers that is already in the partner organizations to share um, some of the tips. Uh, and ultimately, it boils down to the sense of belonging whereby um, we have the friendship ongoing uh, and, of course, the sense of ownership. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Round of applause. All right, thank you, Linda, for sharing uh, comprehensively about the Yodan Arts Program. It's very exciting. Um, can we now have the pigeonhole on the screen uh, as we move on to Rebecca, uh, who I understand doesn't have slides. But what I want you guys to is to also look at some of the questions that are being asked right now. We have a very comprehensive set, and uh, we hope to uh, have the, ans the questions uh, with the most upvotes being answered first. All right? So we'll jump right into that after James. Rebecca, please. Okay, so my heart is beating really fast because I have no slides, I have no video. So like a typical young punk, um, I feel very unprepared. <laughs> but I think in that sense, I think just, just to bring the point back to why I keep calling ourselves young punks, I think a lot of us are very busy, very restless, nervous, always doing many things, and maybe we're not very good at it, you know? We do it differently, we may be unprepared, we may be kind of all over the place. But I would like to believe that all these young punks have their hearts in the right place. So I think to just take it back to four years ago, I think, um, I mean, definitely there's a lot of expertise on this stage, but if I can just share more from a personal point of view. Four years ago, I asked myself, what kind of volunteer am I? And I remember this story, I think about 10 years ago, I was volunteering in the Yellow Ribbon Fund, right? And I was managing this carnival games thing where I was asking people to lay long, lay long, $5, come and throw the ball and give me $5. So after like two hours, right, working super hard, right, I was so tired, you know, and I went to the canteen, sat down, and I happened to eat lunch opposite this guy, right, who I saw had a $50 note in his wallet. 
So I was like, okay, I think I'm going to try to convince him to give me that $50. I mean, not for my lunch, you know, but, but for Yellow Ribbon, lah, you know, and, and, and see whether he will and, and whether I'm able to do it. So it became sort of a game, weirdly. I don't know why. The young person, I don't know why I would think that way. Um, but eventually, I just told him about Yellow Ribbon and, and, you know, what we were trying to do. And he was like, okay, so he gave me the $50. And I was like, whoa, you know. Yeah, so I think at that point in time, that's when I realised that maybe I'm not the kind of volunteer that, you know, does the carnival games thing. I mean, not that there's anything wrong. I think they're just different types of volunteering and volunteering looks very different. Um, and I think I started to ask myself two questions. So these are two questions that Cheryl, my co-founder, and I always ask any young volunteers or young people when we speak to them. The first one is, what are you passionate about? And the second thing is, what are you good at? And we realized that people always kind of stumble at the second question. They're like, oh, I'm good at sleeping. Oh, I'm good at eating, you know? And you're like, no, really, like, what are you really good at, you know? And some people, after a while, they're like, okay, la, I think I'm quite persuasive, you know? Or, okay, la, I think I can, you know, manage to, you know, maybe, like, market a few of these things. Or I'm quite good at doing video. And I think that's how we decided to engage our volunteers, which is to ask them, what are they good at? And then to basically use those skills to then volunteer their time or their expertise. And I think for us also, what was very helpful was that we, we tried to, we, we set the context, which was, um, there's this quote that Cheryl and I saw when we went for a conference, it's by a guy called Timothy Prestero from Design That Matters. And he said, basically, the end goal should always be about trying to solve the problem and not being the ones that solve the problem. And I think that was like for us like a eureka moment because we were like, yeah, it's not about us, you know, it's not about what, well, you know, Bex and Cheryl did this or, you know, a whole bunch of us did this and we should like celebrate ourselves or anything. But it should be, did we, you know, kind of, are we, are we still here in, in 10 years time still trying to, to make a difference? So I think for us, like volunteering to us is a bit more long term. And because we do fundraising, I'm sure as you all would know, fundraising is really tiring sometimes and can get really, really like discouraging because people will, like 95% of the time say no, or they listen to you for like 15 minutes, right? Then they, wow, good job. Hmm. Then they walk away, then you're like, eh? <laughs> yeah, so I think sometimes we can get very discouraged. Lah. So I think for us, one thing that we, we tried to do when we engage the, the young people, right, I mean, is to basically find out, like, like I said, what are they good at, right? So we had this one person, right, who like, really liked to eat prata. I know it's, I mean, it's hardly a thing that you would say, oh, I'm very good at eating prata, right? But she just loved to eat prata, right? So what she did was that she said, you know what, I'm going to throw a prata party. I'm going to throw a prata party for, for the, the migrant workers that work in this particular um, site. And then I'm going to also buy them taping. And then I'm going to just hang out and we're going to have a carnival. And that was what she was good at. And that's exactly what she did. And she did a great job of it. You know, so that was her kind of doing something that she enjoyed and something that she also was good at. And the other example would be someone like, let's say, Benjamin King and Nathan Hartono. Everyone's like, wow, they're very handsome, right? Or wow, they can sing, you know, that kind of thing. And a lot of people are like, how do, they, how, how do you meaningfully engage them? Not just say, hey, come and sing at my gala dinner, you know, or like, hey, come to my, 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 my ceremony to come and cut ribbon, you know what I mean? So I asked, what is it that they're really passionate about? So for example, like for Ben, he um, is very passionate about cancer causes. So I said, okay, Ben, can you do a video to just kind of like, encourage people about why you should go for, you know, early detection screening or why, you know, why this matters to you and then you make a personal plea. And he was like, yeah, I you know, very happy to do it. So it's basically really just going to what it, these individuals care about, what is it that they, they think about on a daily basis as they think about the meaning or purpose that they are trying to derive out of their lives and say, hey, why don't you do that instead? Yeah. And I think the one thing that we felt was very helpful was to get them to do it at their own pace and never make them feel like, you know, it's, it's forced or obliged or, okay, you know, like I have to be here every week, uh, one hour. I mean, nothing wrong with that, but I think for some, some youths, they find that very daunting. They're like, oh, I imagine volunteering to be this set standard. If I say I'm going to volunteer, it means I'm committed to like six months, la, you know, three times a week. And then that sounds very like, wow, you know, I don't think I can do it. Especially when, you know, like you said, youths are very busy with different priorities priorities, different passions and, and you know, um, and for the youth that I work with, they, they are, you know, working and starting new careers and all that, starting families as well. So I think we wanted to just be careful with their time. So I would say to some of them like, okay, I know you're super busy, but can I just get one hour lunch with you every month? You know, and then they're like, oh, yeah, I can do that, you know, because that sounds, that sounds doable, right? Like, I mean, if I ask you guys, like, can you guys have lunch with me? 
sounds really weird. <laughs> like, you probably be like, okay, one hour lunch is fine, right? But if I say, hey, can I meet you every day this week um, for one hour at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., you'd be like, wow, this girl very intense, right? So I think it's more of like trying to figure out like the way, like how to engage people and how to engage them meaningfully. And I think, um, the, I think just on the last point, like what we young people or young punks are trying to do is to constantly ask ourselves like, how do we volunteer better? You know, so I think we've done different movements, we've done 50 for 50, we've done Pledge It Forward. Some have been good, some of them have not done as well, you know, and we keep learning from the different things that we've done wrongly as well to see how we can improve. But I think one thing that we as an organisation really learnt is how do we get better at knowing our subject matter? You know, so if let's say we want to work with seniors, you know, if I gather a group of young people to talk about how to work with seniors, that's, that's not right because we're the seniors, right? We don't want to just be a bunch of young punks trying to solve a problem that we totally don't understand. And then, I mean, it just might be condescending in that sense. So I think what we're trying to do now is to improve our knowledge, not assume, and also understand a particular subject matter. So actually, the social co is now focusing a lot on elder care or basically senior living, so we should talk, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and kind of getting different industry professionals to come together with seniors in the room, always have seniors in the room, to talk about simple things like, what does design mean to you? Because what design means to me can be very different from what a 70-year-old thinks of design, you know? And I think the problem with some youth, uh, some of the young volunteers is that they get very caught up with a, a particular like, oh, oh like, hey, uh, you know, it's a good idea. Then they, yeah, yeah, it's a very good idea. Then everyone validates each other, like, oh, we think it's a good idea. Then when you ask the seniors, they're like, uh... Okay, la, I don't think I'll do this, la, you know? So I think we, we just wanted to be a bit more careful with the way that we um, volunteer. So, so yeah, so I think we, what we're trying to do now is in order to be better volunteers, we are trying to learn and spend more time with VWOs to really understand, like for example, for seniors, I want to spend more time with my, with my grandfather. I think I'm always just, like, I think like you try to figure out like how do you improve communication between young people and seniors, you know, like we all know we should spend more time with our parents and our grandparents, but we don't. Like why? Is it language? Is it dialect? Is it awkwardness? Is it, there's so many different factors. So I think for us, we are trying to kind of just understand that a bit better. And that's what volunteering looks like to, to me. Yeah. All right, that's great. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, we're gonna move on to the last panelist, uh, James. What do you do at EMA Emmaus, sorry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we actually do is actually helping charities to build, basically build their capacity and capability in volunteer management. So, um, yeah, my, my slides are there. Can you get the slides, please? Can I have my slides, please? Okay, so basically for, um, yeah, okay, that's, uh, so today basically, can I just ask, uh, have you actually heard of the app called Tinder? Yes, you know, right? You just swipe left, swipe right, right? Not, not that I used it. Uh, not my era. Okay. <laughs> All right. But um, when I was actually thinking about today's um, presentation, I kind of think about it and I kind of relate to this because when I first, uh, just now I shared that actually I started as a social worker and then kind of somehow became an accidental volunteer manager. So volunteer management has never been on my cards. I've never thought of doing volunteer management because being a young social worker, a young punk then, I wanted to do direct work, you know, with people, and then here I am, gone down the route of doing volunteer management. What is this? You know, I'm, I'm the furthest away from the beneficiaries. I'm working with volunteers. But I, I started to actually see myself as a matchmaker. If you actually kind of think about it, I'm actually trying to understand what the needs or the potential of the organizations are, and I'm going out to find people. And you're basically also trying to find volunteers and you know, they, volunteers do come with different expectations and all that as well. And then you kind of find how the organization meets that. Also. So kind of like a matchmaker. So today, you know, from what I'm actually sharing, it's not so much of uh, saying that, oh, I, I know it all, but it's, um, I, I kind of entitled this, um, you know, collaborating for collective good, uh, the winning or whining formula, <laughs> you know, because it does make a difference, you know, whether you, how you work with volunteers, it could be a winning formula or whining formula. So, um, so that's just a little bit about me. And so if, uh, I'm sorry, can I just? <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that's, that, that's a little bit like, uh, about what, how I saw my role uh, as a matchmaker. So the question is then, what's the big deal about this whole thing? You know, why, why, why should we actually even look about working with, for example, youth? The first thing, of course, is that all of us know that worldwide there is a trend towards episodic volunteering. People are volunteering less and less. 
right? Gone are the days where people like stay on for like 20 years service, 25 years service. Uh, you can get them to stay two weeks is good already, right? So with this, it actually becomes very difficult to get volunteers. And there you actually have a group of people who are in a way captive audience who you could actually work with uh, who actually come, can come on board. And I quite like uh, what some of them has mentioned. I think there is always this thing about the youth, even though, yes, when they are coming on board, they may come on board uh, very short term, but don't forget they could stay. They could stay if they have a very positive, good experience, right, with your... So we started thinking about that and just saying that, yeah, I mean, this is, this is actually a potential pool you could work with, so why should I not look at working with youth, you know? Um, of course, the other thing about it is youth, uh, the profile of youth itself... Um, I actually, when I was working in one of my previous organizations, right, I think typically what we do is that we always, when people go to the website, you kind of list down, I need volunteers for this, I need volunteers for this, I need volunteers for this. So when I went, I, I said, I want to try something different. I want to encourage volunteer-initiated projects. So I actually provided a pathway, uh, and I actually went to create a template for people to actually propose projects. And true enough, most of these projects that came through are actually mainly from youth because they have ideas. And frankly speaking, you, you can sit in the social service organization and can keep thinking about the same thing, you know, it's like no new ideas. But sometimes the, the, the youth can come with very fresh ideas. You know, later I'll actually share with you a case study of a youth group that I've actually worked with. And if you think about it, end of the day, another reason why this is a big deal is because I always find that working with volunteers, especially with youth volunteers, to be a very win-win situation. Because on one hand, you get volunteers to actually help you, on the other hand, you're actually building these youths up. Have you ever thought about that? Um, one of the groups that I actually work with, you know, um, uh, is this group of volunteers who actually do, did fundraising, and they actually come in, come back every year, once every year, to do a 10-day fundraising project, okay, where they actually um, give wrapped and in exchange for donation during the Christmas period. So they have been volunteering many years with me, and then one day, you know, they went to the university, and they came to me, you know, and they were quite very proud. They said, you know, uh, when I go and look at all my CCA people, uh, their organization skill cannot make it, you know. So I say, yeah, you don't be yeah, yeah, just because you had a head start. Lah. Because from the very beginning, when they actually proposed for the projects, right, we actually gave them, in a way, quite a bit of autonomy to, to run things. Um, believe it or not, we even allowed them to meet up with the malls. They actually went to meet up with Capital Land Mall, you know, with all the malls, you know, uh, Asia, Fraser, all that. And they actually went to negotiate that. We actually allowed them. Of course, initially, we went with them. But then they actually had the opportunity to actually learn a lot of skills that they later on found to be very useful. Whether it's in university or even going in, you know, to work. Um, the last I heard, the, the two leaders now have started working already, you know. And I, I believe the skills that they picked up actually helped them in the work. And lastly, I believe that this is actually sowing because don't forget, these youth volunteers will become adults. They will become your adult volunteers as well. And a lot of these people will go into companies because I also realized, uh, I don't know whether statistics show, but I think there are more CSR uh, projects now, right? Companies are coming, knocking on doors, they want to do CSR. A lot of companies are also turning inwards and asking their employees, which, or which organization shall we support? Some of your youths may go into this organization and they may say, support this organization, you know, I've been volunteering, it's a very good cause. So it's sowing for the future as well. So I thought, actually, it's, it's a big deal, you know, why we should work with youth volunteers. So um, this is basically the project that I'm talking to you about. Uh, it's called Love Fat. Um, it's basically a, um, it's a volunteer, it actually started in 2007, they came to me when they were still students in, in uh, Anderson Junior College at the time, they wanted to do project work, uh, and it has grown from strength to strength ever since then. Uh, when I left my previous organization, I actually just told them, I said, why don't you go and work with more charities? Don't just focus on that one charity, help more charities. So, um, it grew into a movement, the last I heard is that they are even thinking of making this into social enterprise, which is good, you know? Uh, so, yeah. So, end of the day, this formula, I guess, is all about chemistry. You know, it's all about how you put, and if I can just summarize, uh, remember I say I'm a matchmaker, right? So, a lot of times what I'm doing is actually trying to match the two sides. So, I kind of like to use this picture of a bridge. On one end, you actually have the nonprofits. On the other end, you actually have the volunteer sending organization. So, here are just a few, uh, I won't go too much into it, but basically what I found, it helps. Uh, one is recognize that your volunteers do come with needs as well. They do come with different um, uh, experience, different interests, you know. Um, so, one particular project I remember is that I worked with uh, you, a polytechnic and uh, design school. And the uh, students actually needed to do actually 
the lecturer came to us and says, can we collaborate? Because they actually need to do photo journals. So I said, sure. I needed to feature my volunteers. Why don't you do a volunteer journal of all my volunteers? They shadowed the volunteers and they came back, they told me, in a way, their life perspective changed because they get to hear from the volunteers and their values and why they actually volunteer. So recognize that they actually come with different um, expectations, different needs, and how do you actually do you meet that? It's not just about you meeting. Remember, it's a win-win. The second is resonate. Yeah, I think Alida mentioned giving them purpose. You know, why is it that they're volunteering? Why does it make such a big deal about them coming to volunteering with you? Uh, raise them up, you know, um, position them for success. Uh, give them the resources they need, um, but also allow them to fail. Yeah, so with uh, Love for a Dollar, there was one time I actually saw them, Anna, they were actually doing the volunteer appreciation for their own volunteers, and they were typing all 100 over certificates one by one. And then I just I went to them and said, do you know there's something called mail merch? And then I just said, you go and research. <laughs> so later on, they actually learned that. So yeah, allow them to actually learn, but also make mistakes. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to do everything for them, but raise them up, uh, allow them to um, guide them to success and all that. Uh, re relate is basically you allow them to be in communities. I think. I don't think it's just peculiar to youth. Anybody, we are all social beings. We need to be in community. And I think sometimes even providing opportunities for them to come and volunteer as a group helps. I mean, think about it. If people actually say that being volunteering feels like being oppressed by adults, right? Do you know how difficult it is for a young volunteer to come to an organization? It's very intimidating, you know. It's just one person. If you allow the whole of them, just maybe a few of them to come and volunteer together, it's actually a different question, uh, different ball game altogether. Rejuvenate them by sharing the success, sharing the results, and then um, doing reflections, uh, debrief with them, find out how they actually grown. Um, one of the projects for Love Fed, I always remember, it's, it's very interesting. They actually, I like to ask them for stories. I say, tell me what happened at the, at the, at the ground, on the ground. They say there was once they were doing this um, uh, gift wrapping and then there was this gentleman looking very edgy, very, 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 looks like very impatient and he was holding on to a box of donuts. So I was just thinking, who wants to wrap a box of donuts? You know, and then he was queuing, queuing, queuing. And then by the time he queued up all the way, he reached the, the front, right? He actually put the donuts there and said, these are for you. It's not to be wrapped, it's, these are for you. And they told me, say, that they were like totally awed by the whole situation. It was like, this is not something that they encountered before. Very quickly, for the, on the other side is the volunteer sending organization. And I just want to highlight a few uh, maybe helpful guidelines. Uh, one is, again, recognize that charities do have limitations. Uh, we cannot take in, uh, or at least the social service organizations cannot take in last minute requests, cannot take in big numbers of people. Uh, Although the biggest number I have dealt with is actually 1,000. Um, but we, we kind of have a very interesting way of actually uh, getting that done. So um, recognize that the organizations have its limitations. Um, and also the clients actually has different needs as well. You know, not, for example, one I was talking to someone and he says, not all clients need rice, you know. Sometimes clients got too much rice and the client got diabetes. They give rice. You know, is, is that really what the client needs? Um, again, help them to resonate with the cause that they're supporting. Uh, raise them up, allow them to, f to learn, support them, uh, relinquish leadership to them, and uh, maybe, and also help them to realize. So sometimes, how you help them to realize the potential of the project is maybe to just ask very important questions. Um, how is this sustainable? Does this really meet real needs? You know? um, so helping them to really shape that, but again, allowing them space to really build that autonomy into it. So really, end of the day, it's, it's really, these are some of the things that I found it helps for me, and I hope uh, it helps you as well as uh, you go out and be matchmakers and really form that wonderful marriage between the volunteers and the, the organizations. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, James. Round of applause, please. All right, so James shared about his winning formula. I hope you guys took a picture of that. Um, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the pigeonhole. We've got quite a few exciting questions. Um, so we'll start with the first one that currently on my screen has 37 votes. Um, so what it, the question is asking, I'll just read it out since we haven't got, got it on the screen yet. Um, on the topic of career building, the honing of skills and needs matching, is it possible to work more with, say, Skills Future as well as other non-government initiatives in a way that is collaborative? All right, that's quite a lot of words. Let's try and break it down. Oh, that got bumped up. All right, let's stick to that, okay? So how do we work better with Skills Future or non-government initiatives in a way that's collaborative, maybe from your organization's point of view? 
Okay, so uh, at this point of time, I'm going to remind the speakers, we're going to try and keep this to one minute per response so that we get everyone to go around. If you don't have an answer, don't feel pressured to answer it. Um, and yeah, let's hope we have uh, a, a bit more time to answer more questions. Well, so I, I had one point on the career building part of things. Um, but I guess the question is, is it, I may not directly answer the question, but I'll give it a go. Um, so one of the things that we, we found or we, we thought of was that if you give volunteers the opportunity to run their own initiatives and all, um, there are actually a couple of things that make it beneficial for career building. So one of them could be uh, having, well, first of all, something very tangible to put on your resume, right? Um, I think on top of that, like James mentioned, it's a lot of skills building. So working with people uh, and, and all of that actually also helps to make you a little bit more attractive uh, in terms of, of employment. Uh, can't really comment directly on things like skills future. I mean, I do suppose in, in some instances, you can take some of the skills, um, like, like Rebecca mentioned, in, in terms of marketing and video making and all of that, and uh, apply it to a, a volunteering for a charity kind of a context. Yep. Maybe maybe I can, I can try, try to answer the question. So I think it's more of, um, an accidental thing that happened with um, Airbnb. So Airbnb, um, they, they launched this thing called Experiences, where instead of just you know, renting a, a place to stay, you can try out local experiences. So I think one part of the experiences that you can work on is basically doing something that is with social, that's social impact related. So I think I was just browsing one day, and I saw that there was, I mean, I don't know whether you consider this a skill. La. To me, it's a skill, la. but um, it is um, learning how to cook chap chai. You know, and it was with Auntie Catherine, who is from the Touch Senior Activity Center, and I was like, okay, la, I go, you know, because I want to look, I want to learn how to make chap chai, because it's Hainanese chap chai, and it was from my grandpa. Um, and at the same time, I learned a new skill, but I also, you know, whatever I pay for this, 100% goes to Touch Senior Activity Center. So after going for that one time, I was like, this is really good because you know, Auntie Catherine was an amazing teacher. The chap chai was very yummy. You know, and I decided to just like ready some other friends to basically go and learn how to make chap chai la. So tomorrow actually we're going to go and learn how to make chap chai. <laughs> um, and it's something that was completely unplanned and you know, it's an unexpected, I guess, working relationship. Wow. So Auntie Catherine having a platform to uh, teach people how to make chap chai as a passion. So that brings me to my actually next point, which I'm hoping the other two panelists can answer. So how can we leverage on technology to promote volunteerism? Um, for example, matching volunteers with organizations and maybe being a platform for volunteering collaborations as well. Um, the thought was also, if so, where does the funding come from? So we heard about Airbnb as well um, with experiences. So that was a private sector initiative. So funding definitely um, is uh, sustainable in a, in a larger sense. Um, maybe for the other two panelists, are there any instances where tech has uh, been an enabler other than mail merge, uh, which you shared? Um, okay, so I guess down here is talking about using technology to promote and I don't think it's using technology to manage volunteers, right? So in terms of using technology, I believe there are existingly, I think existing out there, there are a, a really a few solutions that you don't really have, like giving.sg and all that. Um, the, I think there's the SG Cares app and all that also that you could actually use. Um, so sometimes I'm, I'm also a bit worried because if you, do, you do want to have too many solutions out there also because you kind of like spread everybody across uh, and then you, you also want to actually have people going to certain places to find where the volunteer opportunities are. So there are actually, uh, existingly, there are um, solutions out there that you can actually kind of find. Um, do a bit of resource sharing. I, I, I believe volunteer managers tend to actually be very, very resourceful. You know, it's just a matter of whether how do you actually share the resources and, um, with one another. Um, yeah, and, but for that, I think there are, in terms of funding, if you're talking about technology for managing volunteers, then yes, there are also solutions out there. And I, I believe uh, NCSS actually has some um, funding. I think you can go and talk about, to them about it um, under VCF or something like that. So uh, again, I'm not the authority in this area, so I'm not sure, but uh, I do know that there are uh, areas like that that can help you as well. Yeah. 
James, you also mentioned being the Tinder of uh, matchmaking, right? So has there been any apps that you kind of sense have fulfilled that function of being like a Tinder for volunteerism? I haven't seen that, although actually in a previous volunteer training that I did for volunteer managers, one group very interestingly came up with the idea for Vinder. So it's volunteer Tinder. So I don't know. I mean, if there's anybody out there who's enterprising enough who wants to go and explore this, you know, where you just swipe left and right to find your volunteers or your left and right to find your organization, I thought that might be an interesting idea. Um, yeah, but it's quite exciting to see whether that will materialize. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, in order to promote volunteerism among the youths, I think you need to target where they are. And I think at this point in time, they are using a lot of the social media. So it also depends on the resources that you have at your own organization. We do run uh, ads on like Facebook or we use our Instagram. We get our, let's say our youth volunteers or our interns to actually come up with Insta story with whatever um, activities that's ongoing, we actually capture it on all these platforms and then get them to share. Um, we also have like um, volunteer leaders out there. Um, we get them to share their own volunteering experience uh, and then get them to share among their friends because uh, we realize that word of mouth really get them to come on board. I think the other thing if, um, if it is geared towards the managing of volunteers, at Youth Call, we actually developed this uh, Youth Call portal whereby um, any youth who is interested, they can just sign up. It is free of charge to be a member and immediately they can see all the volunteering opportunities um, in Youth Call. Um, and I think gradually, ultimately, um, Singapore will have a, a, a VMS 3.0 system um, whereby um, in the first phase, it will be government organizations to um, come on board first to share the volunteering opportunities and uh, subsequently, maybe you can see how um, um, different VWOs can come on board um, to, to tap on this kind of volunteer matching uh, system. Yeah. Um, sorry, maybe I just share one, one last thing is that I uh, just suddenly remember as well. Um, many, many, I think last year or two years ago, I actually worked with this group. Have you heard of meetup.com? Yeah. Where they are basically a group of people who meet up uh, based on certain interests. So uh, I basically went to meetup.com and I actually went, and there are actually, you'll be surprised, there are actually quite a few um, interest groups in Singapore that actually does volunteering. So what I did was that I actually connected to some of these leaders and then basically uh, I got access to their volunteers and then we talked about possible volunteer collaboration and I, th that doesn't require you to spend a single cent. It's just a matter of reaching out to these for our leaders. Right. So the point that Alinda shared, VMS 3.0, sounds like a very uh, whole of government approach. Um, which brings us to the next question, which asks uh, various agencies such as SS. I, uh, YCS, MVPC, promote skills training and volunteering opportunities. How do we bridge and scaffold and synergize these efforts? Perhaps through a platform like VMS 3.0? Okay, tough, tough question to answer. Uh, I think to start off, um, all three organizations, and actually other organizations as well, there's some form of skills training, but we try and make sure that we don't duplicate um, by, by catering to like specific areas. So SSI does some very specific uh, trainings for volunteers in terms of learning how to work with uh, certain, like maybe people with disabilities, for example. Um, and then I know YCS has a certain set of training programs that I think apply for uh, the youth core volunteers and leaders. Um, with, for MVPC, actually, we don't have that many training programs at the moment uh, for, for volunteers uh, specifically. Um, so, so that's actually one way that we're trying not to duplicate efforts. Um, and then also, like, the last, last thing I need to plug in for is for SGCAS, right? Because we, we all come out, uh, under the national movement um, called SGCAS. So that's, that's a way of getting everybody to the table and, and talking a little bit more and making sure that we can all um, spread our resources and, and achieve greater impact. All right, is there anyone else who would like to take this question? You good? All right, so we have time for one final question, uh, which I'm gonna choose since I'm the moderator. So it's actually the one with 17 votes, but uh, it's asking a very important question, uh, especially with fellow uh, volunteers and volunteer managers in the room. Uh, the question is, how can we prevent burnout of volunteers? Uh, and volunteer managers. Okay, I guess it's um, burnout will be my topic. <laughs> um, I may not be the right person because I burnt out as a volunteer manager. <laughs> but I think with volunteers, uh, we 
in my previous organization, we actually um, put together our own volunteer training. Uh, and specifically with my team, we actually told volunteers, we had a segment on self-care. Because if you imagine being a volunteer, you cannot just keep giving. And we, very, we were very deliberate, intentional in putting that as a segment because we want to message to the person that you, know, you need to self-care. And so um, one of the things we brought to mind, uh, because in the training we talk about self-awareness and then self-care, we actually got them to uh, talk about their misconceptions about taking breaks. And you'll be very surprised. Some volunteers actually think that taking break is a big no-no, you know, it's like a big sin. You can't take breaks. How can you do that? There are tons of uh, other needs out there. Um, so we have to actually take that opportunity to correct some of these things. In fact, we actually very openly tell the volunteers, say that it is okay to take breaks. If you need to, come to us, talk to us, talk to... I mean, don't just burn down and just disappear, you know. I mean, we'd rather be a little bit proactive and, uh, and preventing it from happening in the very first place. Volunteer managers, of course, um, you know, like you know, like what Rebecca mentioned, you actually you connect with your volunteers. You kind of know whether they are burning out, um, and you talk to them lah, before it happens. Uh, volunteer managers, I think it, this role, frankly speaking, if you ask me, is a very tough role. You are actually doing a lot of different things. So um, one thing I find that helped me lah, Okay, even I even even though I eventually burnt out. But I think I kind of pushed burnout a bit later is that I actually work with volunteers. A lot of volunteer managers kind of forgot that you keep finding volunteers for other people, right? What about finding volunteers for help you? You know, uh, there, so there was once, uh, what happened was that I realized that I had a lot of interviews to do. I didn't have time. I got to do the policy. I got to do the IT, the IT system. I got to do the interviews, the screening. So what I did was I actually went out and I actually find people who could help me do volunteer interviews. So I actually trained one or two person and they actually helped me do uh, so I think it's really being a bit strategic in that sense of knowing how to manage your own workload uh, and knowing when to say no and knowing when to voice out, knowing when to get help, you know, and, and don't, don't just keep giving because I think volunteer managers sometimes with your kind of role, you can keep giving and you forget about caring for yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, think, I think for me, it would be a very simple and maybe like the thing which is to, to almost have like a buddy system because I, I think sometimes... I just need someone to say, you know what, this sucks. You know, this is really hard. You know, this, like, let's go eat prata. You know, I don't know why I keep talking about prata, but, you know, let's go do something else. You know what I mean? Let's go do something else together. Um, we can communally agree that this is terrible or, you know, it's just a tough day and then we will just take the weekend off and we come back again. I think that's the, the first, and first thing that I would recommend. I think the second thing is to also constantly... Um, keep yourself inspired with what's coming up and what's new. So not just within Singapore, but kind of looking at things like fastcompany.com, seeing what's being done around the world or seeing how technology can really help to, to change things. I think the more I read, the more I kind of like, you know, kind of keep myself inspired, I feel that, okay, you know, like, you know, I think I can, I think I can, you know, and then it's, it's better lah for me. Um, I think if the issue is about burnout and preventing burnout, that means the group of people that we're looking at are actually very passionate. Um, volunteers who are already serving but continue to serve in many different organisations um, or volunteers who are working until 4am but still turn up at 8am at the home. Um, so I think what, what it boils down to is, uh, first of all, acknowledge the good work that they have uh, been doing. Um, but before we can even acknowledge is to know them as a person. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, as volunteer managers, uh, when we are managing volunteers, we should sort of have an idea of who are the really passionate ones and going all out to serve the community. Um, it's willing to know them as an individual and is to have constant check-in with this kind of people, um, this group of people, because we do have um, people like accountants who work until 4 a.m. and every single Saturday they turn up at 8 a.m. Uh, and what we do is really to give them that um, personal care and concern. And the volunteering family thing that um, we spoke about just now, Buddy, um, with regards to volunteer managers, if they are experiencing burning out or soon to burn out, I, I think it's more of because volunteers always turn up at weekday night, if not, then it's Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I, I guess it will be uh, on the onus of the uh, organisation to actually check in with the staff and to let them have uh, sufficient rest um, during the weekdays. Yeah. All right, so with that, there was a final question. Thank you very much, panellists. Um, we will just end with a quick round. Um, one final tip you give to the audience right here.
Well, um, I will still go back to burnout since. So don't burn out. I mean, you are, you are basically, the way I see is that you, whatever you are doing, whether as a volunteer sending organization, as a volunteer or as a volunteer manager, uh, you are really doing good. And I think we need more of people like that, but we, we cannot have you burn out. So you just basically need to take good care of yourself. Yeah, that's all. All right, thank you, Rebecca. I think it is very similar to your point, but it's just knowing that you also matter that your place in the world is important, that what you're doing is important, that you know, the fact that you guys are all here and you know, the work that you are doing is important. And I think, yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you, I mean, for all the work that you guys are doing. And yeah. Um, for me, I think uh, there are two. For those who are coming from schools, educators, um, I think the core of what we do is really to plant the seeds of volunteering and to have the empathy in our students. Um, I think maybe um, some of you are already doing it. For some of those who haven't, um, it's really down to what is the community need. Instead of getting the youths, uh, instead of getting the students to start their own projects. So maybe go back to the question, what is the community need? Um, then for those um, social service organizations, um, it's about uh, maybe you want to think through a volunteering journey and how would you make changes to create that positive volunteering experience so that from a one-off volunteer, they can become regular volunteer and ultimately go back to your organization and be a volunteer leader. Yeah. Um, I think I'll say something to build on Linda's point earlier and, and also because uh, most of the people in the room are you know, either educators or social service uh, practitioners, right, which is... I think just now when we were talking about burnout, um, we were talking about one of the things that, that keep us going and it's remembering that you are actually not doing this alone, remembering that you are doing this and serving people who want to make the world better and, and drawing inspiration from people who are around you outside of your organisation as well. All right, the ecosystem is doing good. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being part of that ecosystem of doing good. Um, and we'll hand the time now to the MC, who I believe is presenting the panelists with tokens of appreciation. Round of applause, please. All right, thank you, uh, plenary speakers, for sharing your perspectives. Uh, please remain on stage for the presentation of our token of appreciation. We would like to invite Ms. Angela Wong, Deputy Director, Engagement, Youth Corps Singapore, to present tokens of appreciation to our speakers. Ms. Wong, please. Firstly, we have Mr. Pua Siliang. Ms. Rebecca Lin. Ms. Alinda Heng. James Lim. And of course, our moderator, Mr. Sainto. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, let's put our hands together for the speakers of Plenary Session 2. May I invite the plenary speakers and the moderator for a good photo? Gentlemen, before the end of the day's program, we would like to invite you to complete a survey of the symposium. Your feedback will be great, greatly beneficial for our future planning. Please refer to the instructions on the screen for participants assessing the app. With your registered emails, you may assess the survey in the symposium app. For participants assessing the app via our generic emails, please scan the following QR code or follow the link for the survey. We will be giving you some time to complete the survey. Thank you.
Thank you once again. We have come to the end of the symposium for the day. Please come back to the symposium microsite and app to view and download the symposium photos, videos, and chat material. We will also like to remind you to look out for the Asia Pacific Regional Conference in Service Learning in 2019. It will be held in Singapore for the first time and it is hosted by the Singapore University of Social Sciences. We hope to see you then. Later, when you guys are taking your leave, at both of our exits, we actually have a box for you to place your lanyards if you no longer wish to keep it. These lanyards will then be used either by any social organisation or anyone who would actually like to collect these lanyards. Please just approach any YCS staff who will instruct you on how you can get hold of these lanyards for your organisation's future use. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us today. And may we all leave inspired to continue building and contributing to the ecosystem for collective positive impact to the community. We wish you all of you a very good evening. Thank, thank you. you.